This is our first year uh, doing communication days. We had almost 40 events between yesterday morning and today, tonight, and you can see in the faces of especially the staff that have been working so hard uh, throughout these two days and before preparing for these events. But I think also we know that this, although it took a lot of work from the staff and the faculty to put it together, it's certainly been very much a successful uh, group of events and we plan to keep doing next year and hopefully every year after that. Uh, the reason why we created this event, and now that this is the closing panel, uh, was so that we can have conversations about the conversation that we are going to have tonight. And I've been looking forward to this event for a long time. We've talked to, I've been talking to Michael Park about organizing an event like this uh, for a while, and then came the opportunity to put it together as part of uh, communication days. Uh, so Michael Park, if you don't know him, uh, sitting over there, he... He's an, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Studies uh, in sports communication. He's also a specialist uh, in law and communication law and, and, and media law in First Amendment. Uh, and the idea, he had the idea to put this panel together and he can tell you a little bit more about what his idea was and how the panel kind of transformed a long time. And he can also introduce to you the panelists. We are very happy to have them here and welcome them to Emerson, to Boston. So, Michael, yeah, take it thank away. you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if the mic is the mic on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for coming. Um, it's it's really a pleasure and honor uh, to be part of the uh, the bookend, the uh, the final event of Communication Days here. So, thank you for coming. Um, before I introduce our our, our guests here. Um, I just want to point out that uh, sort of the genesis of this talk uh, really started with the idea of sports and social change and sort of sports as a vehicle for social change. And I wanted, uh, you know, to get a, a number of uh, panelists that can bring different perspectives that can talk about uh, the issue of sports and social change. And, and really one of my, one of my top uh, targets, uh, recruiting targets was uh, 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 a pitcher named James uh, Mudcat Grant, who was the first uh, black uh, pitcher to win 20 games in a season, um, was one of John F. Kennedy's uh, favorite uh, baseball players, a former all-star, just a, a legend in his own right. And he actually uh, took part in his own uh, national anthem protest. I know that's something that's been in the news a lot in the last few years, uh, particularly in the NFL, so I thought, you know, bringing him with that that perspective and story um, would be just you know be so helpful and informative, uh, but unfortunately uh, you know he had health issues and um, uh, you know is suffering now from from cancer, um, and he just learned about some some new health issues. So uh, originally he agreed to come, but you know he couldn't join us. So um, so anyway, I just wanted to you know include that that you know we we, we try to get uh, a number of different uh, perspectives and viewpoints. Um, so, it, you know, it wasn't like, oh, you know, it seems like, you know, we don't have representative uh, or people that represent, um, you know, a particular perspective or from a racial background, um, but, you know, it was, it was just a, a matter of issues of scheduling and um, uh, health issues in age. So we really, really try to get, uh, uh, you know, different types of uh, 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 perspectives. And so, anyway, I just wanted to just include that. Um, and so let me let me uh, in introduce our, our wonderful uh, sports uh, panel. I've got a great lineup, uh, pun intended. Um, tough crowd, tough crowd. Um, uh, so let me let me start uh, first uh, with uh, uh, I, I think our elder. Uh, well, let me just, I'll just check at the end with Dan and then just go down. Uh, professor Daniel Durbin, uh, professor at uh, USC who specializes in sports uh, sports media and the rhetoric of sports, and he's also the uh, founding director of the Annenberg Institute of Sports, Media, and Society, um, and so we're really thankful that he's, uh, that he's able to join us. Um, and next to, uh, next to Dan is Nate Boyer, uh, brings a, a really interesting, uh, multiple perspectives, I think, um, on, our, on our topic today. Uh, he's a, a former member of the U.S. Special Forces, a former Green Beret, uh, also played uh, football for the University of Texas. Um, I think that's a pretty big football school, right? Um, 
Uh, also briefly played for the uh, Seahawks, and then most recently hosted uh, the show Indivisible for the NFL Network, which uh, I believe was, was picked up by uh, ESPN. Um, and next to Nate, we have uh, our, our elder statesman here, uh, Vern Law, who's really uh, a living legend. I mean that in the best, best way, Vern. Uh, 16 seasons with the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, a Cy Young winner, uh, former All-Star World Series champion, started game one, four, and seven in the 1960 World Series against those, uh, the team we love to hate, the Yankees, right? Um, and uh, so, th I mean, there's, I can go on and on. We only have a finite amount of time. But another interesting fact is, you know, he's really the last remaining pitcher uh, that we have that, that pitched against uh, Jackie Robinson, right? Uh, and um, also, Vern, you recently had a birthday, turned the young age of, of 89. So happy birthday, Vern. Yay. Yes. All right. uh, and then uh, last but not least, uh, Stan, our own uh, Emerson Stan Nance, Associate Whoa. Athletic Director. Yes, yes. Uh, who's, been, uh, who's been here since 2003 um, and has a long track record in, in coaching and sports administration at, at several schools before coming to Emerson. We're really lucky to have him. And he himself was a former student athlete uh, and played uh, uh, sorry, competitively in Division I uh, for Rutgers, including uh, we're, we're in the midst of March Madness, and I know Stan played in, in, in the Final Four, right, another Rutgers team. So welcome, Stan. Thank you. So, Okay. Thank you. So I thought uh, I'd start off, um, Vern, uh, I... You know, I, I just mentioned you were the, one of the last, or you are the last remaining former major leaguer to have pitched uh, against Jackie Robinson. And uh, you really witnessed, I think, firsthand, um, you know, the discrimination and, and the vitriol and, and the hate that a lot of these uh, f uh, players, particularly black players, uh, faced. Can you, can you talk about or share with us what you witnessed early in your career particularly in certain areas, I think uh, uh, New Orleans comes to mind, um, and, and sort of what you witnessed about how you know, black players were treated when you were, when you were starting out as a ball player? Thank you. Uh, it's most interesting because uh, I was born and raised in uh, a little town of Meridian, Idaho. Uh, that, uh, uh, there was no people of color there. I did play again, you know, with sports and everything. We did have one athlete who was a person of color, and that that played in uh, in uh, Idaho, and that was in Boise. And so that was, you know, an, a great young man, you know, and a good athlete, and he 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 was uh, pretty well known, you know. But uh, uh, my real introduction came when I, like you mentioned, I was went to New Orleans. And, you know, I couldn't believe what I saw, you know, the way that uh, others were treated. Uh, you'd have, uh, um, well, first of all, I, I found you get on the bus, they have a little sign that says, uh, uh, the black people to the back, the white people sit in front. And uh, I, I I, I, I questioned that, you know, and wondered why that was so. And and then uh, further on, my, you know, drinking fountains, white, black, you know, and everything was segregated back then. And and you know, people seemed to accept that uh, somewhat. Uh, but I I didn't uh, I didn't really uh, felt that it was right that people be treated human beings being treated so differently. And uh, then when I, because I only spent, I only spent about two and a half months there because I was called up, because I got off to a good start, I was called up to Pittsburgh. And so then uh, we, uh, that was a new introduction for me as well, because I, uh, it, it was a time when, when, you know, you could walk down the street if you had a white shirt on, by the time you got to the end of it, why well, it, it was gray with all the silt that was just coming mm -hmm. down through the air. Uh, it, you know, and yet people accepted that because that's the way they made their living, you know, and, and that, was, uh, that was accepted. Uh, it certainly is accepted today, as you well know. And, uh, 
Well then, you know, uh, when we went to Brooklyn to play, uh, that was my first introduction. Uh, I did pitch at that point against Jackie Robinson, but uh, when I heard the cat calls and, uh, and there was an open knife at first base that uh, we, somebody picked up. And, and stuff like that was going on and you could, uh, you could hear from, from the fans as well. And there was some from guys yelling from the bench uh, from, from my team. And I, you know, I was amazed that, uh, that somebody from my, my team that I was on would, would act like that. But it even got worse when we went out to, air, uh, out to Los Angeles. They told us to be sure and sit kind of low in your seat because you're going through the, the black part of the company, you know, uh, getting to the ballpark. And, uh, and there, you know, there was shootings going on and, and, and so, you know, but the, thankful, the, you know, the bus driver knew the safest route, I guess, because we didn't encounter any of those kinds of things. And, and yet, we, I had a couple guys that's on the New Orleans team that, uh, that were black. And, and so what happened was when we went on the road and, and we had, uh, when, we, when we had one of the guys on our team, why, we'd go in to eat at a restaurant and uh, they wouldn't let him come in. And so what we did, we, we made our orders and everything, and, and uh, when we found out what was happening, why, we all got up and left. And I thought that was a, the right thing to do. So they didn't make any, uh, any profit or didn't. Uh, <laughs> with our orders, I hope the, the cook got a good, a good uh, uh, bake gone and because he's going to have to give it to somebody. And uh, because we, uh, we all walked out on it. So yeah, there, we, we, we kind of protested ourselves in, in that manner. But uh, pitching against Jackie Robinson was, was the thing that, you know, that really got me more than anything to see somebody treated like that. Because he was not only a great ball player, but I'll tell you one thing, he was a good person too. I knew that. I could tell by his actions and so forth. Branch Rickey told him that when somebody kicks dirt on you or spits on you or anything like that, you can't respond because if you do, you're going to ruin it for everybody. Uh, well, let me just say, Jackie was a better man than me because I, I tell you, I couldn't take what he took. Mm. But I, I certainly, certainly mm. admire and respect Jackie Robinson for Thank what you. he stood for and also for the kind of person he was. You know, gosh, he was a great athlete. Uh, he played, was it, at, at UCLA, was it, uh, yeah. where he played? And, and he also served in his service, you know, um, well-educated, well-spoken. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, it took a little while, but before he gained the respect of everybody because of the way he acted and the way he uh, performed and also the kind of person he was, uh, you, you know, my hat's off to him and, and, and my respect, the love that I feel for everybody, I felt for him because he certainly deserved it from the way he uh, governed his life. Thank you, thank you, Vern. That's, that's wow, it's incredible that, that you had to witness firsthand uh, what had went on. It's, it's, it's incredible, um, that kind of perspective that you bring. Thank you. Um, this, for Dan, uh, Professor Durbin, um, how has how has sports as a as a platform for let's say social change differed or changed from the time when you know players like Vern was playing uh, in the league versus uh, you know today and maybe what what are some of the social issues that you find are the most salient um, then and, and and today? Well, one of the challenges when uh, Vern was playing uh, was that uh, athletes were treated as day laborers. Uh, Kurt Flood, of course, famously uh, said that uh, baseball players were well-paid slaves. Uh, frankly, they weren't well-paid. Uh, they were paid, uh, but they weren't well-paid. Uh, and uh, you, you, look at the, you look at the numbers today, it's uh, around $426 million uh, that um, um, uh, Mike Kraut's getting in his next contract. 
I mentioned to, to Vern, that's about $425,775,000 more than you made in your entire career. Uh, players, players were not well compensated, and there was always the threat that you could immediately be cut. So, uh, you know, attempting to make a public statement uh, in uh, the days that Vern played, that Jackie Robinson played, was much more challenging. Uh, you, ultimately, you had to uh, communicate by your actions much more than by your words because there was the perpetual threat that if you said anything uh, or uh, in any way acted in contrary to the, the desires of baseball, football, and the other sports, that you would just disappear. You'd never have a, a job again. And so that was, you know, that was a, it was a much more challenging time. Uh, many of the issues continue to be the same, uh, issues of race, issues of gender, issues of disability, uh, a whole variety of other issues. That, that are kind of endemic to the conversation of sports uh, and especially sports in the United States uh, remain part of the conversation. And of course, the, um, uh, the amount of money that ownership is making and the amount of money that uh, players get and the exploitation of players uh, it becomes part of the ongoing conversation. One thing that you did not hear as much about uh, 60 or 70 years ago that you hear a lot about today is the physical safety of players. Uh, the uh, CTE uh, discussion has really amped up that that uh, concern. So you have you, you have a little bit of evolution in that, but so many of the uh, of the conversation points have really have not changed uh, that far in the last 50, 60, 70 years. We still run into the same challenges. Thank you. Uh, you know, in the, in the last uh, few years, we've certainly have seen sports be used as a as a platform for social change. Um, you know, certainly to, uh, uh, as players have used sports to, to address a lot of uh, issues off the field, a lot of social issues off the field. Um, and, and certainly when Vern was playing with Mudcat and Jackie Robinson, they were addressing not only issues on the field, but, but off the field as well. And of course, in the last couple of years, we've heard a lot about, um, you know, in the NFL, for instance, uh, kneeling during the national anthem, particularly this kind of resurgence of, of protests started by Colin Kaepernick, of course, is in the news just uh, today as well, apparently for not winning his, uh, unfortunately for him, this collusion case. But, um, but he certainly wasn't the first one to engage in a protest um, on the field um, and using sports, uh, certainly as that platform for social change. In fact, uh, James Mudcat Grant, who uh, we unfortunately couldn't make it today, was also engaged in uh, a protest of his own during the national anthem. And I think, uh, Professor Durbin, you have some uh, insight into that uh, experience or that story. So if you've ever met uh, Jim Grant, uh, he's one of the sweetest human beings on earth. Uh, in fact, I actually told him one time, uh, I said, uh, hey, look at, you, you can find footage from the 1965 World Series of him pitching. And I said, I, I, one time I said to him, I said, Jim, you have the gentlest eyes. You, you wouldn't think that you could throw such a nasty curveball by somebody. You have such gentle eyes when you're looking into the plate. He said, oh yeah, Aretha Franklin used to tell me that. Uh, Jim knew just about everyone and uh, got around just about everywhere, partially because he is such an affable, likable, sweet human being. There's a sweet good nature to, to Jim. Uh, he's become a really dear friend of mine. Uh, but also because Jim would not be quiet. Uh, when players were supposed to be quiet, Jim would not be quiet. Uh, and he has a number of stories about uh, taking on uh, some of the, uh, the racist issues of the time. Uh, he likes to tell a story. He had a friend, Gary Bell, who's another pitcher on the Cleveland Indians. He used to call Gary Bell his redneck friend because Gary is from Texas. And he said they were in Arizona. Now in Arizona, all the way up into the 1960s, they had separate facilities for drinking water for uh, African Americans and for European American uh, players. And um, uh, Jim uh, and, uh, and Gary were wandering through and they noticed that and he, Jim said, yeah, Gary came over to me and said, hey, I'm gonna, we're gonna make a big social change here, Jim. And Jim said, no, you're gonna get me killed. What's going on? And he said, no, you, we're, we're gonna change things. No, you're gonna get me killed. No, we're gonna change. So they go over, there's a, a, a long drinking fountain and one side of the drinking fountain says colored uh, uh, players, and the other side says white players. And there happened to be a slight slope to it. The, the colored players a little higher up. And Gary Bell took Mudcat over to the security guard who was there. 
It's a, it started this lengthy diatribe about the problem of this drinking fountain to the security guard. He said, you know, my black friend over here, he drinks up there and he slobbers over it and it dribbles down and it gets into my water. And how can you have him dribbling into my water and it's coming down the thing? He said, uh, he said the, uh, Jim said the security guard started getting madder and madder and then started uh, just blowing them off saying it was, it, it, he was being an idiot and he was just uh, being stupid about it. Uh, but the next day, there was one drinking fountain. Uh, so the conversation, even if, it's, uh, even if it was done just trying to pop people's buttons, the conversation actually did have some impact. So Jim, <clears throat> it's interesting, I was uh, speaking at the Hall of Fame last year, and I happened to notice that on one of the programs related to what I was doing, there was somebody who uh, had actually written a research paper on the first, uh, the first uh, national anthem protest. Uh, and this is a story Jim loves to tell. He's told it thousands of times uh, and told it thousands of different ways. I'll give you uh, the, uh, one of the uh, main versions. Uh, so this is in Cleveland, uh, and he's playing with the Cleveland Indians. Uh, it's the early 1960s. And uh, Jim was in the bullpen. He wasn't pitching that day. He was in the bullpen. And the national anthem goes on. Everybody stands up and sings the national anthem. And they get to the very end of the national anthem, and uh, Jim finishes the song with some variation. He's told this a number of different ways, but it's some variation of uh, the land of the not so free, especially if you're in Tennessee. And that, uh, now that got a reaction. There was a, an assistant pitching coach. Uh, who came from the South, who did not react well to that. Uh, and he uh, told uh, Jim if he didn't like it, he could leave the country. At which point, Jim said, well, it'd be better to leave the country than to be in Texas, which is where the pitching coach is from, which led to, uh, suddenly it all melted down. Uh, and there was uh, some sort of altercation, at which point Jim simply left the ball field. Uh, and uh, so, no, you, you, as a player, you were never allowed to leave the ball field. So Jim, and Jim said, I, I did the wrong thing. I shouldn't have left the ball field. I should have punched the guy out, but I shouldn't have left the ball field. So he got suspended for, I think it was seven games, uh, for leaving the ball field. Uh, the pitching coach was let go. So there was some impact from it, uh, and, but it's become kind of a legendary story, uh, partially because Jim has had now uh, 60 years where he's retold and retold and retold that story. And I do, you know, Jim's stories do change over time, partially due to, uh, you know, memory, uh, but a lot of it is due to the fact that Jim will tell a story uh, and try to, to put it into the context of the audience he's speaking to. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile remembering that. So Jim will point out elements of a story that he thinks are important for the conversation he's having. Uh, and so the, you know, the, the reason that story seems to emphasize one thing at one time, one, another thing another time, is Jim is always talking to the circumstance and the situation of the moment and trying to shape his story so that they make sense to people uh, at, at a given time. Um, but it's a, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a reflection of something that's become now an ongoing story in Major League Baseball. The actual, this is long before Colin uh, sat down, uh, the what is now the you know in baseball lore the first national anthem protest. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that, that the protest by Mudcat Grant for, during the national anthem that's you know happened decades uh, long before we had Instagram, right, or social media to be able to record this and in, in smartphones. So it's it's certainly an important story uh, uh, and that needs to be remembered, right? And so, um, uh, but he certainly wasn't. Uh, I mean, Colin, Colin Kaepernick certainly wasn't the first. But we certainly remember him because it happened more recently in a, in a time where, where advanced communication technology. Um, and so speaking of, of Colin Kaepernick and, and his uh, position and decision to, to first sit during the national anthem and then ultimately later to kneel, um, you know, we're seeing again this kind of resurgence of uh, using sports uh, as a platform for uh, symbolic uh, messaging and social change. And, and I thought I would ask uh, Stan, just as a, as a former player and, and, and now uh, administrative uh, official, but just as a human being too, is, is just what was your you know, reaction when you heard about um, you know, an athlete like Colin Kaepernick sitting 
during the national anthem? Well, first thing I thought about was that um, back at Rutgers, we, um, the year before I got there, uh, the Black Student Union took over the court. Uh, Rutgers was playing a, playing a game. And um, so usually, usually you have to take ownership. <laughs> Because once you do it, you got to take ownership. Um, and he took ownership because <laughs> he kept doing it. And um, he kept doing it until it cost him his job. So I think you got to believe in what you're doing, and then you just got to keep doing it. So it's, um, um, my brother told me one time, he said, what someone thinks about you, everybody don't think about you that way the same way. <laughs> so. Um, Whatever you're known for, you got to take ownership of it, and you got to keep doing it. And Captain, whether right or wrong, he kept mm -hmm. doing it, and he took ownership. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it is pretty rare. It's a it's a rare instance of of someone with a, a social conscious, uh, you know, essentially risking his professional career and life uh, for an important social issue, which you don't see. Uh, you haven't seen it really in a while, the past few decades, um, but we're seeing certainly, I think, a resurgence of that with players like LeBron James uh, and others that have been more vocal uh, and active. Uh, Nate, you know, you, you, pre you bring a very interesting and, and a unique perspective as someone who served um, uh, in, the, in the military but also was, a, uh, was an athlete uh, in your own right. What was your uh, initial reaction when you heard about um, Colin Kaepernick really just sitting down during the national anthem? Uh, you know, initially, uh, I think the, the first thing that came to mind was like, you know, why is this guy doing it? I think it was more than anything just like this guttural, um, it, you know, it kind of hurt my feelings, to be honest, mm. to, be on, to, to be real. It's like, I mean, I've served in the military, you know, a, a, a folded flag is handed to uh, a mother of, you know, my brother if he's killed overseas. And, you know, that song's very symbolic and meaningful mm -hmm. to us in the military. But at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's my perspective. And because of my experience, that's why I feel that way. It doesn't mean that the song or the flag actually represents that to everybody. Um, but I, I grew up a Niner fan, and I was a big Colin Kaepernick fan because, you know, he, he, he played for the Niners, and he was, I thought he was better than Alex Smith. Uh, and I, so I pulled for him from day one. Like in preseason pre games, I remember watching him. I'm like, this guy should be starting. And eventually he did, and then he led him to the Super Bowl and almost won the Super Bowl. Um, and, you know, he, he had about three pretty amazing years there where he was – you know, very, very dominant. Um, and then, so then when this happened, I mean, all I saw was a, a few headlines and a photograph of him sitting, and I didn't, I didn't really care to ask why. Um, but as the week went on, you know, and I heard a lot of people in the military um, that were feeling the same way that I was, I started to kind of research it a little bit more, and then this, the story started to come out more, and then Colin started speaking about why. And... You know, I, I understood that it was like it had nothing to do with, re really, it had very little to do with the, uh, with those symbols themselves. He just chose that time because it was an impactful time, uh, where he knew people would be listening. It would create discomfort, and I think that is the purpose of a protest. And at the end of the day, as a service member, as a warfighter, I took an oath to defend. The Constitution, which includes the First Amendment, which has freedom of speech as part of that amendment. So for me, it was like, it doesn't matter. I don't have to agree. I don't have to even like it. Uh, it's still if done peacefully, uh, and it's something that somebody cares about, then I, I took the oath to defend that person and what they're saying. Um, and it can get very you know, convoluted and complicated, especially when the media gets so involved and narratives change and you know things are taken out of context and we only hear one part of an interview or see a photograph or you know see a picture of pig socks or whatever it is you know and everybody just goes in a million directions not to mention this was in the middle of the election between you know hillary versus donald and like everybody was like you got to take a side and it's like us against them whatever side you're on 
and it was uh, it was it was frustrating as a veteran because I, I'm a I'm a pretty kind of middle of the road sort of person when it comes. I don't really like politics, <laughs> to be honest. I, I guess I just don't really like a lot of politicians. No offense if there's politicians here, but um, you know. And so for me, it was like to, to come back, you know, to come back from deployments to a place where it seemed very divided and is getting worse and worse. You know, is 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 frustrating. And, uh, and so I, I wrote this open letter through the Army Times because, first of all, no one reads the Army Times, and <laughs> not even people in the Army. Turns out one time they yeah. did. Yeah, one time they did. Yeah. Uh, but I was getting reached out to from like CNN and then from Fox and from you know, conservative news uh, organizations and liberal ones, and I was like, I don't want to write anything for any of them or even do an interview because if somebody sees that, they're going to assume that I'm on a team, you know, or I'm on one side of this deal, and I'm, that's just not where I wanted to position myself, and that's not really where I'm coming from. So I chose that because it was sort of a, an unpolitical publication, and, and I told him I'll only do it if I can write it in my own words and, you know, see the final edit myself. And so I did the, wrote this open letter, and uh, just sort of explaining my background, experiences, feelings about everything, uh, and my initial reactions, but also that I was willing to listen and I wanted to learn more and, uh, and call and read it and a lot, a lot of people read it. It went like super viral the next day because a lot of sports writers shared it um, and I think a lot of people felt the same way I did. I think most of us in our country are pretty reasonable, you know what I mean? People are reasonable people and they understand uh, that our experiences typically craft the message or our own narrative uh, and feelings about things. But uh, Colin read it himself and he reached out to me, you know, he called me up and said he wanted to meet and talk about things and I was like, wow, okay. Um, I thought that was pretty uh, incredible, pretty big of him, you know. Uh, and being in that position that during that week where he was just getting, you know, he was getting applauded by one side and just totally attacked by the other. So I went down and met him in San Diego. Uh, they were playing the Chargers in the final preseason game. Um, and he was starting that night. It was military appreciation night because it was right before uh, the 9-11 anniversary. And uh, we met in the lobby of the team hotel for like two hours and just talked with Eric Reed and just talked uh, about this whole situation and talked about our backgrounds and talked about football. And, you know, it was just two, two guys that were, you know, chopping it up, having a discussion face to face, um, which usually is so much more civil than when anything we ever see on social media. And uh, we, we agreed on a lot of things. We didn't agree on some things. But uh, he did ask me if there was another way that he thought, that I thought he could protest or demonstrate that wouldn't offend people in the military. And I said, look, first of all, you have to understand you're not offending everybody in the military. Maybe some people, but you're offending some people that aren't in the military. And, uh, but there's also, there's people that wear camouflage that are supporting you and feel like you're, what you're doing is important. And uh, so, I said, I said, if anything, if you, if, if you feel like you have to change and you're not going to stand, which he said he would not do, um, I suggested p perhaps taking a knee because uh, I thought that that was, first of all, it's almost symbolic of a, maybe a flag at half mast, uh, but also, you know, people take a knee to pray and propose to their wives. Um, it, it's, in my experience, it's never really been seen as a s form of disrespect in any culture. Um, it's the, quite the opposite, actually. And also, you know, in football, when a player is injured on the field, like, everybody takes a knee out of respect. And in the military, when we visit Arlington, we take a knee in front of headstones to pay respects. So he thought that that was a good idea. And, and you know, I thought it was great that he was going to be alongside his teammates and not kind of isolated on the bench. And um, I agreed to stand next to him that night at the game. And I went out there. You know, he's on the sideline. He goes to take a knee. You know, and still there are boos, uh, which was which was pretty interesting and crazy. You know, we had an African American uh, Navy uh, sailor that was singing the national anthem on the field, and you know, people are booing during it um, because somebody's uh, demonstrating. So, I've learned a lot through this whole thing. You know, it's been uh, over two years now since then, and uh, it's a it's a complicated issue. But at the same time, I think. We're having this panel partly because of that, but there's been so many discussions uh, and conversations that have sprung out of it that are really positive and good.
despite all the continued hate and vitriol that we see in our country. So I think that it was absolutely necessary and, uh, you know, I've learned a lot. That's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Nate, Nate, if I could just follow up, you, you, you mentioned that you were just inundated with a lot of messages, uh, media outlets, uh, including, you know, uh, both left and right. Um, and just based on your experience and conversations with, you know, those in the military or other uh, athletes or former athletes, how was the, his act or Colin's act of sitting or kneeling, how was it interpreted? You know, you, you said you, you felt very offended. You had this kind of visceral reaction when, you know, you see someone sitting, uh, you know, during the national anthem. But, but, you know, he claims that at the end of the day, it's, it's really about him trying to raise awareness about these social issues, about unreasonable use of, of force, uh, deadly force against uh, particularly African-Americans and, and black, young black men. And I was just kind of curious about what you heard. Was that what was understood or was that completely just, you know, they were just kind of oblivious to what the, the motive was behind it. They just saw someone sitting during the national anthem, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I guess, I'm kind of wondering too. If is that because we are so polarized today? Is it just kind of people are uh, kind of have blinders on? They're just not willing to to either accept or, or interpret a, a, a symbolic act like that is is about are you talking about like specifically in the military or just in general? Or just maybe in general, or, or yeah. yeah but I mean, I think I think that's just it's in, it's it's each individual's responsibility to actually do some research and dig, you know? And sometimes it's hard to find the answers. Um, it's not as simple as just maybe Googling something and spending a minute. You know, you really gotta, you gotta go back and read through what these people have actually said, what their cause is, you know? A lot of, uh, a lot of those men that have demonstrated, probably, I would be willing to bet almost all of them throughout history, had some sort of, uh, not just like a message, but an actual cause, work they were doing in the community or a foundation they, set up to actually um, be a part of seeking those changes, you know? And so that's on everybody. And if people, I think if people, uh, if, they, if they aren't open to uh, considering or even, you know, ever changing their mind, like they're not going to look into that stuff or they're just going to ignore it. Um, and that's, you know, that's on them. There's nothing you can really do about that. But I don't think it's, I, don't, I certainly don't think it's an across the board thing. I mean, there was people like me uh, I'm sure during those early stages, probably a lot of people th that were in the military because of uh, those symbols and how special mm -hmm. they are to us that had a similar reaction to me. And I feel like, I mean, I can empathize with that because I felt the same way. And it, and it took me, I think, I think it helped me that I played sports and I was um, you know, around locker rooms like that. I understood in very few places in, in the country, I believe, uh, are like locker rooms in the, in the sports and like team rooms in the military where people are from all over the country, backgrounds, religions, skin colors, all that stuff. And y y you know, you, you may have nothing in common with the guy who's got a locker next to you, um, but you go through training camp with him and you start to you know, learn about him and, and what he believes and why he believes in his family. And you, you, know, you grow closer to them. You, you, you get those opportunities in, in college, you know, and hopefully you take advantage of those opportunities you meet. People, especially at a place like this, I think a lot of students come from all over the place to a school like Emerson. Um, so you have those opportunities. It's very unique. Um, and so, for, you know, for me, if I didn't, if I hadn't served in the military, if I hadn't played, I, I you know, maybe I would have just tuned out to this whole thing too, and just, you know, had my mind made up whether I was uh, liberal or conservative, and just said, oh yeah, I. I I'm 100% with them or I'm 100% against them without even doing my own research and thinking for myself. Michael, can I comment? Yes. Uh, yes. I was on CBS uh, radio right after the, the initial protest, uh, and I got the, the most knuckleheaded question. No offense to anybody at CBS. Uh, but I, I, I just I lit into them. I couldn't hold myself back, uh, which only got more radio stations wanting to talk. Uh, they said, well, don't you think that the, uh, the NFL, an NFL stadium uh, during the national anthem is really an inappropriate place. I mean, people go to the NFL stadiums to watch football. Uh, and I, I immediately went into the, uh, so the, the NFL stadium is like a temple that's, you know, a sanctified ground and a sanctified ground, you can't do anything. I, and I, I, I did a five minute riff, which I'm still almost embarrassed about, but not quite. Um, but the point of the thing was, if you're going to say something, where do you say it? 
Colin Kaepernick had a place to say something, he had a position to say something, and he said something. We're in Boston. There was once a tea party here, and it wasn't a right-wing conservative group. It was, it, was a, uh, it was called a tea party, but it was a message to the British government. How do you talk to the British government? You take their tea. How do you talk to the American people? You take their football. Uh, and you, you put your message on the biggest stage you can. So to me, uh, I, whether you're for or against Colin Kaepernick, it, it, to me it doesn't matter. Number one, he has the right to, but number two, he did to, uh, as someone who wants to say something about the conditions in the United States, he picked the one spot where he really could. He did the smart thing and picked the stage that he had and used that to communicate. So. I just, I wanted to drop that in, sorry. No, absolutely, and we, we've seen this before, 1968 Olympics as well, right, with John Carlos and Tommy Smith, right, raising their fists during the national anthem. They certainly took that moment, right, to, to send a message, you know, for social injustice around the world, and, and that, that one moment then forever changed their lives. They, can, they were banned from the Olympics, and it came at great risk and great sacrifice, and, um, and so uh, very well, uh, well stated point there, uh, Dr. Durbin. Um, yes. Could I, could yes. I, yes. I want yes, to sir. talk about Jackie Robinson a little bit. There's some information you may not know uh, about him was that when he joined the Dodgers, there was a protest among the players, and I, you know, and this was uh, uh, it was pretty strong. You know, the guys they were going to leave the field. You know, and and Branch Rickey, he he just he he held a meeting and says. We're going to play. I'll bring the people up in the minor leagues. You'll be gone, you know. And and so, but it did. It did really break up the team, you know, to the point that finally Pee Wee Reese got the team together, and he talked to him about this. And Pee Wee was really the the voice of the of the Dodgers back then, and and he was able to convince the players, let's give them a chance. Let's just give them a chance. Well, Jackie, after the games were over and they could see what he added to the ball club was a great difference. And, and, and I, I think that, that really made a difference the way the, the, the players themselves felt about Jackie Robinson. And, but even more so, Jackie would not, he would wait until everybody was out of, out of the shower before he would go in, you know. And, and he, was given, he was given every respect, I think, until finally Pee Wee talked to him and says, it's okay, come on in, come on in, you know, be accepted, you know. And, and, and it took a while, but it finally came, finally came together. I, I, I feel pretty strong about how can you hate somebody just because he's got a different skin? You know, and he's a human being, and he is, uh, yeah, he right, is, yeah. I'll tell you, yeah, sure. I had a great one at that. But uh, I don't think that in sports there ought to be, a, you know, when that team came together, they started to win. They really did. Campanella, uh, probably was the best, best catcher I ever saw who could milk a pitching staff. <laughs> but what a, what a wonderful uh, uh, fellow he was as well. And uh, of course he claimed to be, because his name was Campanella, he was, he was a, a Daigle, you know. He was, he was Italian, <laughs> you know. But, but anyway, that, he was uh, another great person who I admired and, and I would love to have had him as a catcher when I first got up there because he really helped their pitching staff. But so, you know, with, in sports, I don't think it, it, and how we came together when, when uh, Roberto and uh, uh, we Roberto had two Clemente. or three guys that joined our team and, and uh, Roberto had such an infectious sm uh, smile and everything and so even, even tempered and so forth, you know, he, uh, he fit right in. There was no problem with us when, when we started getting a lot of uh, color on our ball club. And even Murtaugh, without knowing it, there was not one person on the team on one game that was white. So Murtaugh was colorblind as well. 
And so, you know, that, that makes a real difference in a ball club because when you've got a team that works together, plays together, sleeps together, uh, you know, that's how we, I think that's how the Pirates was able to win in a World Series because we pulled for each other. We loved each other. And, and so it got to the point where we even played like a team because when I first got there, we wasn't much of a team. Because you know, we had a lot of older players there, and they didn't want us rookies taking their job. You know, they wanted to milk out another year or two. So anyway, it was uh, it was a wonderful experience for me to go through this transition and, and, and see the great uh, the greatness that you can find in in the athletes that that, that are of color, and uh, I, I admire and respect their talent as well as them as a person. And so I think that that's, that makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Vern. Vern, if I, if I could just bring up, uh, uh, you, you are a devout uh, Mormon uh, and have been, I think, since, since birth, <laughs> I assume. And, well, and, actually, the church yeah. is known as the Church of Jesus Christ church of Latter-day, Jesus Christ, Saints, Latter-day Saints, Saints. Because we have the a Book of Mormon, Latter-day Scripture, uh, you know, right. why, then that's, uh, sure. you know, that's why everybody calls us right. Mormons. Right, okay. <laughs> a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints, and, and certainly a more, uh, certainly a minority, uh, a more marginalized uh, a religion, obviously, with the, the history with the, here in the U.S., and we've seen other ball players that uh, were also religious. I'm thinking of Jewish players like Sandy Koufax, uh, Hank Greenberg, who, who decided that they were not going to play on certain uh, Jewish uh, holy days, right? So like Yom Kippur, right. uh, and they just, you know, they said they weren't gonna play. You know, Sandy Koufax is really, of course, well, known you know, for that World Series in 1965. This, uh, being a Mormon, you know, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know of any missionary that has been in a convent and talked to 50 nuns about the church. I have, they, they invited me, I didn't mm-hmm. go there. Uh, on my own, but I was invited. And then I also had the privilege of taking my wife, and we spoke to an all-girl Catholic high school that uh, where these sisters, with about eight of them, had come down to the, the stands. And we had Catholics on our ball team, but you know who they called over? Me. <laughs> I don't know why, but they did. <laughs> Maybe they heard that I didn't smoke or didn't drink or didn't chase around or whatever. I don't know, but anyway... Uh, I was invited to go and, and do that, and, and what do, I've had more experiences with uh, ministers of color, and also that uh, we've just, uh, it's been a marvelous experience for mm-hmm. me to experience all of these wonderful things. Most of the ball players, yeah. other guys, they got all the paid, they got all the paid uh, uh, promotions and so forth. Right. Me, yeah. I got all the churches, <laughs> I got all the little leaguers, I got the other <laughs> stuff. But I got memories that, that I'll never forget. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, Fern. Um, you know, to bring it back to the, you were talking about um, certainly uh, protest um, and, and, and certainly athletes and uh, professional uh, players that, that engaged in, in a, a, you know, protest or using uh, uh, protests on the field for, for social change. And you, a common sentiment, I think, then and even today has been, you know, oh, you know, just uh, why don't you just stick to sports, right? If you're an athlete, just stick to sports. And, you know, a common one I think that, that LeBron gets subjected is just shut up and dribble, right? I think we've all heard that. Um, and, and I'm, and I'm kind of curious, maybe, Stan, if you want to start us off, is, is should, should athletes, therefore, I mean, you know, this idea of sh- just sticking to sports, um, you know, kind of your, your feeling and reaction to that when you hear that. I mean, you have an interesting perspective being a former player, but now a, a sort of a sports a coach and an administrator. And um, what are your feelings on, well, on that? Well, it's a, it's, it's a platform. Um, we talked about Kaepernick. It, it's a platform to the whole world, um, especially when you're at the highest level in football, or the National Basketball Association, or Major League Baseball. Um, When you do something, it goes out to everything. Um, Not just TV, but the social media. So it's going to get more hits. Um, And um, um, we can't say it's the wrong or the right, but it's it's a platform for change. If you're trying to make a change, that's the platform to do it on because you're going to get the most marketability, mm-hmm. if that's the yeah. if that's the correct word. Um, and then you have you have people though that say, well, we should leave politics out of sport, right? 
what, what do we say to those that say, well, there, you know, we shouldn't have politics and sports don't mix, so let's leave politics out of sports. So I don't know if there's anybody else that wants to Well, you know, I, I think, uh, first of all, if, uh, if, if everybody stuck to their profession and that's all they did, the, the world would be a very boring place. Yes, it would be. Um, yes, it would be. You know, but, but beyond that, like, as, a, as, an, as an athlete, being on the field, one of my favorite things, um, and, and I was fortunate to always live in a time and play in a time where there wasn't segregation, you know, amongst, I can't even imagine, Vern, like, the stadiums, you know, that you play in, not to mention the players, but, like, from the fan standpoint, they probably had to sit in different sections if they were even allowed in the ballpark, you know? And, like, I didn't have that experience, and I'm very grateful. Um, that we've at least are moving, you know, forward in some way. Um, but, you know, one of my favorite things is looking up in the stands and, like, there's very few places probably in the world where, you know, you, you show up to a game, you don't know the person next to you. They look, they may look very different, uh, be from a different place, and they could sp spill beer on you. And five minutes later, you're, like, hugging them because your team scored. Like, that doesn't happen in a lot of places. That's a very unique thing. It's a very special, uh, it's, very, it's what's very special about sports and, and how it has the power to unite us and bring us together. And, you know, with that comes obviously that incredible platform that these athletes and people have. You know, and if we, if we expected, for instance, teachers to just, just read the book to the students, don't, you know, impart your wisdom or opinions or feelings or experiences on them, just read the book and teach them. That's what a teacher does, you know. Then, I mean, what are we doing? We're not gonna, we're, ne we're never gonna grow as a, as a culture, as humanity. Um, and it's just, uh, I don't know, I just, I just find it almost ridiculous um, because, yeah, there's just, we're people, we're human beings. We're not, athletes aren't robots, you know, just like any, anybody else. Like they all have, um, uh, you know, very, very different um, interests, you know, beyond, the game. It's not like, I, I think of the same way in the military community. I think that the veteran community gets, you know, not in a negative way necessarily, but painted as this like, oh, you know, well, they all think this because they went to war, or they all believe, believe this, and, you know, they, they all voted for them, or whatever. And it's just like, that's one of the most diverse microcosms in the country is the veteran community. And when you actually get to know us, um, we feel very different about things, you know, we have our own opinions. And yes, like, when we're on a deployment or something, we have a specific mission. We have to, we, we, we've been signed up for that job, signed up to do that. But that doesn't mean, um, you know, when you punch out for the day or whatever, you, you don't have your own opinions and your own feelings and you don't have the right to still be a human being. You know, I mean, you have those things. And uh, anyway, it's just, I just think it's silly. You know, I, I, from the athlete standpoint, I think you do have to understand um, that you might be risking something you know, you can't just say whatever you want without repercussions. That stuff, uh, that, that does happen, but that happens in, in every profession. And if it's an important cause, then it shouldn't matter. You know, the cause should matter more. And I think in, in Colin's case and a lot of these people's case, men and women that have done this, um, whether they are still playing or, you know, will never play again, um, if they stuck, I, I always respect the person that, you know, stuck to their guns and no matter what, against all, at all costs, you know, was willing to continue uh, on with their message, you know, and to say what they mean and stick by it and be a person of conviction because I care more about that um, than, than almost anything, you know. And, and I think of, uh, you know, I think of, of, the, of the anthem specifically. And uh, I would rather have somebody, as, and I'm saying this as someone that, that, that it means a lot to me. When that song is played, mm -hmm. uh, I have certain feelings and emotions that come up the one, the one game I played in the NFL, I cried on the sideline during the anthem because it just means a lot to me. Um, but I would rather have somebody who did not feel as an equal, that did not feel the country was representative of uh, what that flag and anthem are supposed to mean. I would rather have them um, not stand than somebody stand out of obligation because they think they have to or you know, they, 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 don't feel, um, they don't feel like that same kind of pride I feel then, you know, if, if it doesn't feel that way, then you should fight for making that happen and voice those opinions and try to change it, so. 
Nate, Nate, can I ask you what, can, thank, yeah, thank you. Um, Nate, uh, can I just ask what it, what it means, the, the national anthem means to you, and then also, you know, should there just be, you know, uh, you know we've heard a lot about, you know, uh, you know certainly the president, uh, President Trump wanting to, you know, fine teams if players didn't stand, and, and um, does this mean there, there should be one particular meaning or interpretation of the no. national anthem? Or, but what, what does it mean to you, yeah. first of all? No, that's yeah. a good question. It's actually a really good question. I don't even know if I can specifically articulate it. Um, but for me, it, it, it's always, I mean, it, it's, it's honestly, it's a military song before it was even the anthem. That's, an act, that's a really interesting story. Um, real quick, the, the, you know, the first time that the anthem, at least the first popular time uh, that the Star Spangled Banner, I should say, was ever played at a sporting event was in 1918 at Wrigley Field, the uh, Red Sox versus the Cubs in game one of the World Series. And back then they had these military bands that would play you know, uh, in the stadium. They didn't have, obviously, walk-up songs and all the stuff they have now. Um, and it's the seventh inning stretch. Babe Ruth's on the, on the mound, um, and they're taking infield. And the third baseman for the Cubs was a guy named uh, Fred Thomas, who was uh, in the Navy. And he was granted uh, furlough. This is during World War I. We're in the midst of it. Uh, there had already been a lot of men killed overseas. Um, he was granted furlough from the Navy to play in the World Series. And so he's on third base. And when the Star Spangled Banner started playing, he turned around and faced the American flag and saluted it because that's what he was taught to do. That's what people do in the military. And out of respect, the players in the field out of respect for him, they stopped, you know, taking infield and uh, took their hats off and kind of just stood there. And I guess, uh, as the story goes, the, the crowd all got into it and they all started singing the song together. And it was like sort of a unifying moment. And it was so popular, they did it again in game two. And then when the series came back here to Boston, they played the song before the game and they actually honored um, some men that had been wounded overseas, which is like very much what we do today. And the first time I heard that story, I was like, I'm getting emotional right now, just like thinking about it. I got really overwhelmed because I was like, wow, I mean, that's, that's how I feel and that's how I want everybody to feel. But then I thought about 1918. At that time, there were obviously no people of color on the field. And in the stands, everybody was probably white or if there were people of color, they probably couldn't sit in the same section. And that, you know, that hurt me a great deal at the same time. So it is, uh, it's a really hard question to answer because, um, you know, for me, you know, that song is played um, uh, out, of, out of pride for our country and what we're striving to be, you know, and I still think we're the greatest country in the world and we've, we've come a long way since, um, you know, our inception, you know, through slavery and, and the civil rights movement and all this, but we still have a long way to go. And uh, so for me, it's like that song kind of represents the hope of what we can be. Mm. Um, and I think um, we just have to keep fighting and you need people like, Colin Kaepernick, like, you know, like John Carlos, like Mudcat, like all these people. And you need people uh, with white skin, too, uh, to continue to have the, that dialogue, have these conversations, stand up for what's right against all costs. And, uh, you know, that's the only way we're going to keep moving forward. And it, we're, we're, it's not always going to be perfect. We're going to definitely have a lot of downs along the way. But um, we'll, we'll continue to slowly, uh, gradually move up as long as we still have people committed to, to causes like this. I didn't really answer your question. Yeah. But. No, that's okay. I mean, you know, it's interesting uh, because, you know, it, my students in my, my uh, uh, freedom of communication class would know, but, you know, we, there was a law in Texas not too long ago where you could be arrested uh, and, and serve uh, jail time for burning the flag, right? And, and the idea was that Texas said, well, the, the government of Texas said the flag represents certain things, including, you know, national unity. Um, uh, and, and I always think of, when I think of the national anthem and, and these protests as, in many ways, whether it's the president or organizations or just other fans that have prescribed a certain meaning to the national anthem, and when you have someone like Colin Kaepernick or other athletes that decide to kneel or to sit, it, it, it's, it's, it's really disrupting. Um, you know, certainly disrupting the, their understanding or their interpretation of what the national anthem means just like what the, you know, the flag represents. And I always ask my students, what, is the, what does the US flag mean? And I get four or five different interpretations. And so 
Um, I, I don't, I don't want to speak for Colin Kaepernick, but I'm going to try. And I'm assuming that you know when he's he's kneeling and you know he's raising awareness about uh, uh, these social issues and the unreasonable use of deadly force against uh, uh, African Americans. And he probably doesn't see. I, I don't know, but, but I'm assuming that, you know he doesn't see the national anthem meaning national unity and freedom. That while these you know injustices are are still happening, you know, and I and I think there's there's definitely a disconnect and there's kind of that that divide, at least in terms of what something like the national anthem or the U.S. flag and these traditions mean. So it's interesting, Nate, that you bring up this point that sports is certainly a platform where we can all come together and there's common goals and commonalities and, and uh, but at the same time you have an issue like you know the national anthem being just so polarizing right uh, today and i wonder if that just reflects you know the sort of the, the political you know uh, uh climate of, of today um or if that's maybe so. some undercurrent that's that's you know always been around so but um, anyway, that's a long-winded kind of <laughs> sort of question. But uh, Dr. Durbin, I, I yeah. have an oddball question that yeah. I may ask afterward because uh, it's really an odd question. I want to start with a question, uh, or just comment the question for Nate. Um, it, 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 this will start with an oddball philosophical point. Plato noted that one of the points of sports was to get people ready for war, uh, and uh, and there are similarities. And don't you, do you find, Nate, that uh, in war as well as in sports, before you actually engage in the conflict, you, you have 150 soldiers, you have 150 different points of view, you can get into a fight over virtually anything. When you're engaged in the actual conflict, everybody has to come together and, and be focused on the conflict. And in many respects, all the way up until you're actually in the conflict on the football field, and this includes the national anthem, you have, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, 11 football players on a side uh, for down. You have 11 different opinions until you actually are in the middle of a play, and and then the, you have to have the opinion of one in order to succeed in the play. Is that it, uh, w was that the sense of life in the military? And and, and in fact, you've been in both worlds. <coughs> Would that accurately reflect your experience here? Yeah, I mean, I think <coughs> I think that. You know the fact that both of those groups—I kind of mentioned it earlier—but like that, that when you when you go through something difficult together, um, even though you don't agree on everything, and you don't even sometimes like the people <laughs> that you're fighting alongside or playing alongside, but if you have that common goal <coughs> and then uh, that mission, you know that you want to uh, execute, uh, then you're willing to put that stuff aside because especially if you trained with them at a high level and you've been in the trenches with them and you know, okay, I have, you know, I have nothing in common with this person. We're gonna get done with the day and you know, he's gonna go play video games and I'm gonna go uh, you know, read a book and, uh, about totally different things and we believe in you know, different political views or whatever. Um, but you know, I've, I've, I've sweated alongside this person you know, we, we, we grinded it out together and they, you know, they didn't quit on me in those moments. You know, their true colors were, uh, were, were very clear. And so I know what they're made of, I know what they're capable of, and I know they're not gonna let me down in this situation. So when you get that, when you get that amount of trust, that's why, you know, coaches and commanders in the military, they, wanna, they want the training always to be harder than the game. A lot of that is for those, that purpose of, of unity, you know, and bringing those players together and, and developing trust. That's how you develop trust. And that's the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems with our country right now is like we don't know each other because we don't do anything together. You know what I mean? We're stuck on our phones and it's social media and it's just, social media is just way, you know, most of it's very negative. There's great things that come of it, trust me. I know. But um, in this age, like we just, I, and I'm just as guilty of it as anybody, we just don't, we don't communicate, we don't talk. Um, and like, a great example of that is just colonized two-hour discussion, how civilized it was, and like once you just hear it from somebody and you're looking in their eyes and you see and it's the eyeballs of another human being, all the other stuff sort of melts away when they start speaking and talking about who they are and and and, and you know you're like oh you want the same thing I do, imagine that you know you want what's best for your family and your community and you want to just feel like you belong and you want to matter and you want to. Um, you know, be loved and love others. And they, that's, we all want that stuff, most of us. There's some crazy people out there that don't want that stuff, but most of us want that stuff. Um, 
but it, you know, it, it, we, it's so easy to forget because all we're seeing is like just this negative um, hate, and, and it's it's too easy to buy into. You know, we, we are weak in a lot of ways as human beings, I think. And um, but you develop that toughness through training, you know, and, and, and fighting alongside those people, living with them, spending every day. Like you were talking about Vern, like on the road, you know, you live with those those men and you spend every day with them. And I, I, mean, I imagine in a baseball season, I mean, it's months and months and months every day with those people. They become your brothers. And uh, it's the same way in the military. And so I, that's uh, it's a great question. But yeah, I mean, that, I think that's, that's how it happens. Because, you know, when the season's over and you come back from a deployment, sometimes you don't even hang out with those people anymore. And that's okay. You know, if you don't get along with them, you don't have anything in common, you don't have to, you know, play chess with them. It doesn't matter. Um, but you've developed that, that sense of trust and belief um, and you both have that common goal and common mission and that's all that really matters in those moments. Vern, I've got an absolutely insane question for you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I want you to go back to the farthest corpuscles of your brain and memory. This is going to be, this is going to be the hardest memory question I've ever asked anyone. Uh, but, and, I've, and Nate, I'm sure you know that the experience of the national anthem in 2019 is not at all what the experience of the Star Spangled Banner was in 1918, or 2019, in 1918. Uh, and in fact, the Star Spangled Banner was not the uh, national anthem for some time after 1918. Yeah, 1930, 31. Yeah, and. I've done a lot of research <laughs> since, since this whole thing started. And was <laughs> not consistently played before sporting events. Uh, it was kind of an on and off and on and off. In times of war, it would more often be played. Uh, in times of peace, it less often be played. Uh, and it was not consistent until the mid-1950s when I believe it was, uh, um, oh, I just, I just went out of my brain. Um, but I believe it was St. Louis Browns when they moved to Baltimore. Uh, they stopped playing the national anthem. And this, we're talking the middle of the Cold War. So they stopped playing the national anthem and some fans got upset about it. Then it took, got national news and then the national anthem was just assumed. So it's not like the national anthem has always been this necessary part of the start of sporting events. It's actually, relatively speaking, a, a recent addition to sporting events. Now, the, the furthest reaches of your memory, Vern, do you remember, you, you were pitching in 50-51, do you remember ever pitching a Major League Baseball game where they did not play the national anthem at the start. <laughs> I told you. I don't. I don't yeah. remember. Yeah. You know, but uh, uh, they they always did. Yep. They always did because I know because after you know, you, as a rookie back then, you know, you're you're excited to be there, but then when you get on, you know, you go down the bullpen, you warm up, you get yourself ready, you know, and you don't sleep very much the night before and so forth, you know, you're anxious to get it going, and then you get on the mound, and you got to wait. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, you know, and that was like in 1962, I remember like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. I was fired up. I didn't... I, Every time I turned over, I was going over the Yankee hitters. How am I going to pitch to so and so and so and so? You know, and so, yeah. And then you get on the mound, and then now, you know, uh, you're standing, you, you know, and you're, you know, you appreciate what what's happening, but you know how important it is that you kind of focus your 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 mind on now what you got to do, you know. And and so, yeah, I. Uh, I appreciated that moment, uh, it, but it lasted too long because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you've got people, sometimes you got somebody that sings that song it takes five minutes, <laughs> you know, and it, it's sometimes, uh, you know, you, you, you hear it so many times that sometimes, you know, you're a little bit annoyed when someone gets out there and sings as low that, you know, that uh, you whistle, come on, come on. Vernon, can I, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I'm going to ask a, a selfish. Well, uh, it, you know, it's it's a it's a, it's a wonderful life, no matter what profession you're in. Or being here in school, many of you students, and uh, you know, just enjoy every minute of it because, well, I lost all my family before they were 70, and here I'm 89. Ah, that's awful. That's great. You know, yeah, I should yeah. be gone. I should be gone too. But, Thank the good Lord. He's given me a few more, a few more days that I can get things right. <laughs> so. As I, 
As I listen to these, all of these gentlemen, I, I think about my student athlete experience and how you come together for one common goal. So student athletes, um, you get all type of, um, um, some student athletes go out to be professors, some be doctors, some are lawyers, and some turn into coaches. But you think about the whole community that's here tonight. Um, we are, we, we become what our experiences are. <laughs> so it's, um, um, I've been on some teams where also, the players, the players didn't like one our, another. Also our memories. And mem <laughs> oh, great, great <laughs> memories. That's, that's what I tell our student athletes. Uh, that's when you come back to alumni events, you, when you have great experiences. Right. And, um, um, but th that's who you become. You become because you struggle together, and then it's amazing when everything comes together and you become champions. Uh, we're in the city of champions. Sorry, Nate. <laughs> we're in the city of champions, you know, for the ones that are here we're, now. We're in the city of second place. <laughs> Los Angeles. So, yeah. Oh, so, it, so, but like Fern said, enjoy, enjoy the journey. <laughs> enjoy the journey. I, Stan, I actually have something, a, a question, and, and I've heard there's a lot of different, you know, perspectives on this, but, you know, Michael had mentioned LeBron James, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, and, and with the game of basketball and, mm -hmm. and maybe specifically the NBA, mm -hmm. like, I think my, my perspective is that, by and large, maybe it's some of it's the fan base and the consumer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, with the NFL, mm -hmm. I feel like there may be, it's probably a little bit more of a, by and large, conservative audience. Mm -hmm. And in the NBA, it's by and large, maybe a little bit more of a liberal audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and perhaps that mm -hmm. has something to do with the way the, the mm -hmm. you know the National Basketball Association uh, deals with the players when mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. messages because it seems right. to be a lot more uh, buy -in. less reactive yeah. and yeah. more like supportive. Yeah. Do you yes. know what I mean? Yes, I, what, I agree what, with that. What's your perspective on yes, all that? Yes, I, I, I agree with that. It's um, I think the NBA has had great leadership, <laughs> um, and um, um, and the players have gotten uh, a great collective bargaining. <laughs> Whereas on the other side, the NFL, they didn't have great collective bargaining. It was pretty much ownership. You're going to do this this way. And in the NBA, it's they come together for a common goal, and everybody gets a piece of the pie. <laughs> I mean, that's the, in, in the big picture, that's the perfect world. But we know that's not the perfect world because the NFL is not that way. Right. And Major League Baseball, they have to wait so many years to get the big piece of the pie. Um, um, but I, 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 I do believe it's great leadership and, it's, and they get buying from all around. Um, when something happens, they bring everybody to the table. Right. Um, it's not just the, from the top, this is what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's what I've seen. I, I, and, I, yeah. and the players have a voice. <laughs> right. They really do. And they, they're brought to the table and their voices are heard. I, I think that's one positive through this whole thing from for the NFL mm -hmm. is that they've learned they, they they can no longer you can't just make the decisions that's right. for that's right. the league that's right the, the, you know that's the ownership right. can't just yes. do that because that's yeah. you're right that's how I think that that's they're slowly you know bringing players right. to beings and all that and it, it's it's going to take time it's going to take time and you see with the NBA when something happens like whether it was Trayvon Martin that everybody comes out in a shirt right they really honor. Uh, whether it's Martin Luther King Day, um, baseball, that's Jackie Robinson. And so they, they're getting fan buy-in. Right. Okay. Well, I, I played during the time where it did come from the top. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. There was no free agency, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, Kurt Flood changed that. Mm -hmm. He was the one who changed it. Uh, he uh, didn't want to be a piece of meat. Like a cow, you mm -hmm. take, you know, you quit producing, you get rid of them, mm -hmm. you know. And it, that's kind of the way the players were, too. You, you, when you stop producing, uh, see you later, you know. But uh, uh, but now those things have changed, yes. you know, uh, considerably, really. And, uh, you know, matter of fact, you know, when I signed the contract, my wife, my family, they're excess baggage. They weren't taken care of, you know, but boy, they take care of them now because they know if the ball player's happy, you know, he's going to play better. He's going to be a better ball player because he's happy 
with the situation that he's found himself in now. Uh, I was I was just thrilled just to get on the ball for it, <laughs> put on a major league uniform. You know, but but yeah, it was a burden. It was a burden on us because uh, when I we left spring training, we'd go to as a family, you know, and we enjoy the the time together. We was there, then. I belong to the ball club. They were excess baggage. They had to do, you know, by, they had to get there to Pittsburgh by themselves, hmm. you know, and so on. So, you know, but that's all changed now. Yeah. Yeah. Vern, Thank Vern, goodness. Vern, can I, I'm gonna, if, if I may, can I ask you a very selfish sports question? Because we're also in Boston. And by the way, I want to uh, open it up for some Q&A uh, right after I ask the selfish sports question. But because we're in Boston, uh, can you can you tell us the experience of pitching um, against uh, Ted Williams, and then number two, uh, Jackie Robinson? Since you are the last uh, remaining pitcher to have pitched against Jackie Robinson, can you can you share with us what that was like? Both Ted Williams and I know it was maybe one only one time I think you faced uh, him, and yeah, also okay. uh, pitching that, against that Jackie Robinson. Yeah, that yeah. was in spring training. You know, I knew what a great player he was and all, but. Uh, you know, I, I knew I was only going to see him that one time. You know, thank goodness. <laughs> but you know, matter of fact, I was at his party when the when he retired in 1960. Hmm. That's when he retired. I was in Manchester, New Hampshire, where they were honoring him, and they had this big banquet. A lot of the Yankees were there. Uh, there was just myself from the from the Pirates who was there. And you know a few other guys too from the other ball clubs that had good years, and but we were asked, we were asked, uh, was asked when we had the banquet, uh, you know, to get up and say a few words about uh, Ted Williams, and um, well, when we left the hotel, I noticed that that Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford got into a car, and then they had a brown bag with them. And you can guess what was in that brown bag, but I, did, I wasn't sure, but I had an inkling of what was in there. And so it took about 45 minutes to an hour to get to the, where we was gonna have the banquet. And uh, so I followed Mickey Mantle to, to, the, uh, to, to speak about Ted Williams. And uh, Mickey got up there and he was just a little bit high, you know. <laughs> And he says, the greatest ball player uh, I ever saw was Joe DiMaggio. Huh. Uh, wrong, wrong place And I there. said, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Here we are honoring Ted, and he's, uh, you know, he had just a little bit too much, and now he's giving uh, <laughs> Joe DiMaggio the glad hand. And, and, that, and that was, you know, I was, I was embarrassed because I'm following him. And so I, you know, when, I, when he finished, I now got up, and I... I said, well, uh, Ted, I know that uh, I know that you're a great hitter. I pitched against you one time and was fortunate enough to have you pop up for me. I appreciated that. But uh, uh, again, uh, you know. Uh, Sorry, it's okay. Sorry, Vern. I'm going to cut you off because we're running out of running out of time, and I want to okay. leave it open. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Q well, and A, uh, and it, it sorry. turned out okay. But then, uh, when I said some nice things about Ted, you know, I, yeah. the next the next day, the newspaper yeah. said Ted Williams helps ball players, the other teams, because he wouldn't have talked to uh, yeah. hitting to anybody, huh. and if a player on another team was having yeah. trouble, he would uh, yeah. cool, go to him, and Ted would t straighten him out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well. Uh, is there a, we'll open it up for a question and answer, and is there a mic that maybe we can pass around for, uh, to uh, someone? If you, if you wouldn't mind, if you had a question, you, there's, a, there's a mic up here, if you can uh, just walk over and, and ask your question. If there, yes. Hi, um, I'm gonna ask a question about women athletes in terms of the political spectrum and making an impact. Um, particularly in my mind is the U.S. women's soccer team that's just filed discrimination um, lawsuit again to try to basically wake up the sports world in relationship mm -hmm. to um, women in politics. So I'd like to maybe throw that out as a question of do women have it easier or harder in terms of getting using the arena of the sports stage to get make an impact. I, I think Professor. 
a lot harder for, for women, I would assume. I'm not a woman, obviously, but, uh, you know, I just, just because, you know, that it, it's, it's been really hard for women's professional sports to develop, uh, you know, a following and a belief. Um, and, and it's like, anytime you do anything, they had this discussion about with Serena uh, recently, you know, when she was outspoken against the judge. And, you know, I personally, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, come on, you know, you're ruining this other girl's moment, you know, that's just winning this thing. But at the end of the day, when I listen to Serena's comments afterwards and other people kind of talking about that, it's like, uh, it seems that any time a woman does speak out and has, um, you know, is competitive or, or fiery or whatever, it's like a lot of people's reaction to say, oh, well, that's not feminine. That's not, you know, you're not being a girl. Uh, you're, be, you're acting like a dude, you know what I mean? And like, that's not normal. We don't, you don't do that. Um, you know, and, and all these other stereotypes get kind of thrown into that, which just isn't fair. I mean, I know how, I, I've, had, I've got a sister and I have girlfriends and all, you know, they're as competitive as anybody. And, uh, and, and it's just, it's really not fair and it's really hard. I think that's the biggest hurdle is like getting the, getting the buy-in and the belief um, from people that like, uh, you can still, you can be both of these things, you know what I mean? You can still be 100% um, woman and be tough, competitive, um, an athlete, a champion, you know, a beast on the field, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, th I think we still just have these, these really difficult stereotypes. And so that's tough. And I know there was like a, there was a woman on the soccer team who had, you know, was kneeling this year during uh, the anthem as well. And people talked about it for like a couple weeks maybe, but it, I, don't, I don't even know if I ever heard any of her, heard any of her statements or really you know, um, remember actually getting a chance to hear that. And I bet if I dug deep, I could probably find some stuff, but it definitely wasn't, the microphone wasn't handed to her in that way, you know what I mean? So I think it's much more difficult personally. So a couple of years ago, I, put, I had a gender conference, gender and sports uh, conference at USC. We had Donna Lopiano, who was a legendary, uh, the head of the Women's Sports Federation for years. That exact question came up. And, she, and I'm going to throw the person under the bus here. She lit into Dick Ebersol. Absolutely did. She said, if Dick Ebersol on NBC Sports spent the money in prime time promoting a women's sport the way he spends the money in prime time promoting the NFL, the women's sport would be as big as the NFL. And let's be honest about that in at least two sports. We, we, you know, the, the, we, we can guarantee that the quality is certainly more interesting and better. Women's tennis is, I, I'm sorry for Roger Federer fans, but uh, the women's tennis, uh, the, the quality of, of uh, performance, and anyone who's played tennis knows uh, what Serena Williams does with a tennis ball, is it physiologically impossible. I, I, it's, it just, it, you can't do that. Physics doesn't work that way. Uh, and of course, we have a, uh, a quote, men's uh, national soccer team and a quote, women's national soccer team. Which one has won three stars? That, and, and yet we treat that as if this is an inferior sport. And the, the most important people who treat it that way are people in the media. And so, and Lopiano, that was her point in this, was really the gatekeepers are the people who run networks, the gatekeepers are the, keepers are the people who run uh, media, and so long as they block the door, no one's gonna walk in it. And, and you have to have those gatekeepers open the door and people will suddenly realize that this is sport, and it is exciting, and it is something you should cheer for. When they passed Title IX, you know, I think in college, uh, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of the sport guy, the guys, uh, thought that that was going to take a lot of money away from their program, you know, and I think they were a little bit uh, angry about those kinds of things. But uh, believe me, I support the girls' basketball team at BYU. The, they, I, they work just as hard as the boys, but they don't get any recognition. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's unfortunate. Because, but... I tell you, our, our, our girls' basketball team is in the NCAA, and the men's NCAA at BYU, not in the NCAA. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> They're doing do the pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm proud of them. Yeah. You have another question? Yeah. Um, 50 years from now, do you think we will look at Colin Kaepernick the same way we look at Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali, and uh, the 1968 Olympics protests? Mm. That's a good question. I mean, I, I personally don't think we look at any of those men uh, the same anyway. Uh, but I, I definitely, yeah, I think as time passes and uh, the, the angry voices quiet down, it will be a much more, seen much more as like a, a you know, it was a, a, a positive, powerful thing. And it, I think it will continue, like I was mentioning, to, to move our country forward. Um, you know, whether you have to take a step back for a minute first before you can move forward, like these things have to happen. Um, and so, I, I, you know, that's what I think. I think, I think that, yeah, it'll be... Uh, it'll be it'll be in history books as this you know it won't be a forgotten story. Yeah, and if I could just add, I mean, I think the the, the players that you mentioned really started this legacy, you know, with Muhammad Ali um, and Jackie Robinson. And I think Colin Kaepernick is just you know sort of the more recent uh, uh, kind of a revival of, of that legacy and sort of taking on that that mantle for using sports for for social change. And I, you know, I think the fact that he can't get on a team. I know it's debatable, but I think oftentimes it kind of really does reflect the huge sacrifice that, that he did make um, and putting him, you know, certainly these social issues in the community ahead of himself and his own political career, just like, uh, or personal uh, career, uh, much more so than, uh, or, or just as much as uh, Muhammad Ali did, or uh, certainly Jackie Robinson and John Carlos and, and Tommy Smith as well, yeah. Uh, my question's, sorry, uh, for you, Nate. First, I'd like to thank you for your kind First, I'd like to thank you for your service. Um, but I would I was wondering if you had any specific lessons that you took away with um, from, from your experience with Colin Kaepernick, specifically relating to constructive discourse. Um, two points during your conversations here today that resonated with me was really the value of asking why and seeking to actually, before you judge someone's opinion or judge someone's experience, learning what their experience is. And secondly, that principle of, of having a conversation where you may not agree with their ideas or positions, but you don't question their motive, and you don't have the absolute desire that you need to impart or change their opinion at the end of the day. Um, because I think that one of the, the most important values that came out of your experience was compromise. Um, it's something that I think in the media does get overlooked. And when we talk about, talk about this specific issues and other issues at large, so that's, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think, uh I think going into those conversations, going into any conversation that's got a heavy topic like that, or, or a, you know, a, a, some sort of a divide, um, if you go into that conversation and you're not willing to give something up, <laughs> you know, you're not willing to um, not just listen to the other person, but you're not willing to accept that as a possibility of um, of truth or or you know, something that's very real, then there's no point in having the conversation. You know, you, you, you have to have that type of um, open-mindedness and uh, the word I'm looking for is uh, humility. Thank you, Nate. Uh, you have to have that. And, 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 you know, certainly in that moment, what I was really surprised in, and maybe it was my own prejudice of, of just what the, what the uh, protest was about, you know, I, 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 I immediately probably went to this place of like, Oh, this is a guy that's you know very militant, and he's not mm -hmm. gonna budge on anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was just the opposite. It was like he was asking me, "What do you think?" You know, and genuinely cared to do that, and, and was willing to adjust. And he did that day, very day. You know, he gave something up and said, like, "Okay, well, you know what? I think I do think that's better. I think it's. I think I maybe I should kneel. Maybe I should be alongside my teammates. I'm not compromising my values. You shouldn't compromise that." But you know the way you speak about something, or a gesture you make, or you know just that willingness to consider someone else, like that was huge. And so I gained an enormous amount of respect for him, but also just the discussion. You know, and it doesn't just have to be about this topic, but just like, wow, like someone was willing to go into that. That I, you know, I didn't agree with him on a lot of things, but he was willing to go into that conversation with that type of attitude. Like that's that's pretty inspiring. You know, because I don't know if I would have that, especially being in the. In the, in the media spotlight like he was and, and having all these people just come and at him because you better believe when he did that, there was also people um, um, that completely agreed with him that were like, how could you do that? You're giving up, you're, you know, you're, 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 being, you're an Uncle Tom now or whatever. And it's just like, 
it, I thought that was ridiculous too. I'm just like, man, this guy's just trying to change, he's trying to change the world in some way. You know, he's trying to do something positive and he's taking to, into account everything, you know, at least in that moment. And like, that's a really hard thing to do. It's just like, you know, Jackie Robinson not fighting back, you know? I mean, that's, those are really hard things to do uh, that take a great deal of character. And so, like that, I think that's the number one thing. Though going into going into that, like you have to be willing to accept the fact that you might not have all the answers, <laughs> and just because you feel some way so much, it doesn't mean it's just right. You know, it's just that's just the way you feel. Yeah. My question's also for Nate. I'm gonna keep you busy here. Um, so you had the opportunity uh, to stand next to Colin Kaepernick while he knelt on the sideline, and I think most times we know how a player is treated based on how the media portrays them. And I was wondering if you were aware at all how 49ers management felt about uh, Kaepernick kneeling throughout the season and how his teammates and coaches felt about that as well. Honestly, like way more supportive than the media portrayed, um, you know, which was great to, to, to hear, at least in my experiences. And, and granted, I don't know what they said when I wasn't around, but I, I felt very much like especially the head coach who was Chip Kelly at the time and the owner, uh, Jed York. They both were like, I mean, that was their player. That was somebody they were gonna protect. They were standing, standing beside, you know. Um, they were definitely getting pressure from, you know, from other people, um, from the fan base. Like, you better do something, make a decision, you know, cut him or make him stand or whatever, or, or just come out and completely support what he's doing. And like, they didn't wanna do any of those things. They just like, I wanna support is right, and that's all they wanted to say and do. Um, but I thought that would, and the teammates especially, his teammates were very supportive. He was actually voted, uh, he got like the team leadership award that year, you know what I mean? And he had never really been considered much of a leader in the locker room, you know, much of a captain. He, he kind of, uh, he, he went through a great change over the course of a year or two. And so that was, when you see something like that, I mean, you know, those are, those are voted upon. That's not just that the organization does just do that. Like, oh, this will be a good media stunt. Let's just make him leadership, you know, the, the leader of the team or whatever. Uh, th those awards are voted on by players and organization and all that. So, you know, it shows that type of relationship. And so, I, you know, I, I don't think publicly the organization wanted to get into that and s maybe outwardly say those things because at the end of the day, it is a business and there is the concern of bottom line and, and all that, which is uh, unfortunate, but... I mean, that's, that's where I think that came from. But no, I thought that, that was, it was overwhelmingly positive. And there were certainly players in those locker rooms that didn't agree with what he was doing. But I think in the same token uh, with, with my experience with him, uh, it was probably the way he carried himself that made them you know, pick him as uh, the leader of the team. You know, I would, assu I would assume that there's uh, a lot of people in here who have a lot of faith and a lot of confidence. You can find all these answers in the scriptures if you just read them. You know, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you know, the answers are there about the life of the Savior and how, uh, how he was treated. Another question? I get too emotional when I start talking yeah, about it. It's okay, that's all right, Vern. You know, that's, right. It, it, we can find answers for all these problems, you know, that we're having in our country today, right there. We all look towards Colin Kaepernick as sort of the figurehead of this movement, uh, but just like there was in 1968 where the Australian runner wore a patch on his, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, on his shirt yeah. and mm -hmm. instead of actually participating in the same way, he, he just stood by and sort of showed his support. In what way do you think the masses and the other people that are protesting in the same way as Kaepernick but are not getting that media attention, how sort of important is that for the movement itself? Well, I don't know. I, I, I'll answer uh, what I think is, you know, it generally comes down to, I think, the media attention, right? That uh, certainly we've seen other athletes that engage uh, not just in the NFL, but in other leagues as well. I think there was a the women's soccer um, a player that also engaged in, in a kneel, the national anthem. So I think, you know, obviously a key is, is how much of it's covered by the media and does it get more, you know, likes and becomes viral and gets enough attention where people are seeing that it's, it's certainly not just limited to NFL, but the other athletes have decided to speak up, right, and use their platform and their voice as an athlete on the field uh, to take a stand. And, and again, it, it does come at, uh, I think it comes at great uh, personal, professional 
uh, risk um, because, and I think there's a reason why you haven't seen all players or most players uh, engage in the same type of protests and, and, you know, not to pass judgment, but, you know, players are worried about, you know, their own livelihoods. They have, you know, mouths to feed families. Some aren't making, you know, millions a year, you know, although yeah, it seems like, you know, it is today when we just, we're just learning about, like, Mike Trout's contract. But, but others are, you know, they're not. They're, they're star players. And so, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of different, you know, personal pressures as to why perhaps they can't speak up. But, but when they do, I think it really comes down to how much of the media is, is really covering that. And it's not just, you know, something that's limited to, you know, the, the framework of, of the NFL. I mean, it's... Well, and to go I back to something Nate yeah. brought up earlier, you have uh, athletes all across the political and social spectrum uh, in sports. Uh, some of them uh, really are seeking one sort of social change. Some are seeking uh, other directions in social yeah. change. Yeah. So you can't, uh, you can't uh, put the same stripe on every athlete and say that uh, every athlete's alike. But you do, I think the, the, the thing that becomes significant, uh, as, as the uh, questioner meant, asked uh, or stated, I think the thing that becomes significant is the voices keep carrying on. So even if they are not fully covered by the press, you have voices carry, continue, continuing to carry the message and you have now, uh, you know, you have a president who loves to have a fight with, uh, with anybody and everybody who will take up a fight. So you have a, you have a, a battle going on and have had for a couple of years now uh, between uh, President Trump and the NFL or portions of the NFL mm -hmm. uh, and between Trump and portions of the NBA. And so it keeps a dialogue going, uh, certainly in the country. And I think the willingness of players to, to uh, use the platform, to continue to use the platform, uh, even if Colin Kaepernick isn't actually in the, the league at this point, uh, it continues this dialogue and continues the conversation. And I think that's the, in many respects, a significant takeaway. You might not notice them as much because they weren't first. Uh, yeah. I, I, I give you a, a parallel quick story. So I, I wrote up a, a bit for the start of a project I was doing, the African American experience in Major League Baseball. Uh, and I wrote up, you know, in the 25 years after Jackie Robinson broke baseball's color line, and I handed it to Mudcat Grant. And I said, well, what do you think about this? He read it and he said, well, now I'm going to ask you to change one thing. You need to say when, when Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby mm. broke baseball's color line. Mm. Uh, most people in the United States know who Jackie Robinson was. Most yeah. people don't know who Larry Doby was. Larry Doby was the first African-American player in uh, the American League uh, and followed Jackie Robinson by only a, a, about a month and a half. He followed him to Major League Baseball. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is Larry Doby is not nearly as well remembered, but he continued the process. And with the Dodgers, Don Newcomb and Roy Campanella and Joe Black mm -hmm. continued to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a, you know, the, the fact that there's a second person, and a third person, and a fourth person itself, just that, that sheer fact has mm -hmm. significance mm -hmm. and keeps the conversation going. Mm -hmm. Very well. So currently um, in the MLB, there's still below 10% African-American players in MLB rosters. Um, why do you think that number is still so low? And considering the experiences that Adam Jones has had, do you still think there's a cultural problem in the MLB? Yes, uh, Dr. Dr. question. <laughs> and I, I was telling um, one of your uh, um, fellow students here before the program a story. Uh, I, was, I was on a panel, this was a charitable event involving Movie 42, and I was on a panel. Uh, and Sweet Lou Johnson was there. Sweet Lou Johnson, who claimed to be 83 years of age at the time, uh, he actually admitted to me he was 87 at the time, but he lied because they wouldn't allow him into Major League Baseball if they thought he was 26 instead of 22. And he just kept lying for <laughs> the next 60 years. Uh, Sweet Lou Johnson, this question came up. There was a, there was a q and afterward. This question came up. Uh, and Sweet Lou got up, and, and you know, he's, he's a very affable person. He's, he starts saying, well, you know, there's this reason, there's that reason, there's this other reason, uh, that, uh, that, it's, that baseball really isn't uh, continuing to pick up with the African-American community. And he goes through three or four things, and he says, well, let's face it, it's boring! It is so boring! This is an 87-year-old former baseball player <laughs> telling you 
that his sport is the most boring sport on earth. Uh, and I, there, there's some comedy to that and some truth to that. Baseball does not adapt well to uh, contemporary network television. They've done a great job of translating it over to uh, MLB TV, uh, their, their online media. Uh, but they, they face a challenge in getting their sport out and making it interesting to a more diverse audience uh, because their, their model has been tied so much, first of all, to network television, then to you know, individual broadcasts across a whole variety of cable uh, outlets. Uh, and the, the fact that a lot of people find the sport really pretty boring. So this question is open for anyone. Um, so there seem to be a lot of popular narratives in the media um, that frame sports as a meritocracy and therefore a sense, um, like in a sense a vehicle for social um, and racial harmony, you know, bringing together successful athletes of any race, but how do you see and then therefore kind of work to prevent these myths um, from shifting the attention on like the social and institutional inequalities that still exists, exist for minorities? I think there's a, there's a tension always in sport because uh, th there is an element of sport that is a meritocracy. But at the same time, there's an element of sport that is purely socialized. And, I, and there's, take it back to the question about soccer. Uh, soccer is a growing sport in the United States, but we still promote the men's national team far more than we promote the women's national team. We pay uh, the men players much more than we pay the, the women players. At the same time, we know for a fact uh, that the women's soccer team has been far more successful. Yes. Far more successful. There is a meritocracy to the degree that we will recognize success, but that doesn't get rid of the social problems that we still face. Uh, and and it, you know, we have to work out these problems in society as well as in sport in order to create a, a better place for everyone in sport. Uh, and so it's a, that, I think, is really the challenge here is, you know, we, we uh, sport does lend itself to a type of meritocracy, but there will always be challenges when we see people uh, in, uh, in ways as inferior uh, simply because we've created that narrative for ourselves. So, we, you know, this is a, this is a we changing as much as, uh, as sport changing and as, as we open the dialogue and open the platforms, uh, you, you're gonna find, I mean, come on, let's, what, have you ever seen a more dominating performance than the first 20 minutes of the uh, Women's World Soccer Cup uh, last game? U.S. just absolutely uh, blistered the opposing team, and it was, a, it was, that was fantastic sports performance. Uh, you, but that was also, you know, it was a challenge to get that uh, to, really put that forward uh, as, uh, in, in our culture, something that was as important as uh, the Super Bowl. And, and if I could just add, I think there's also, we think about sort of the neoliberalist uh, principles, right, that have really infected universities and, and big time college sports. When you think about, you know, uh, applying these market principles to sports where, you know, the big revenue generating sports get all the attention and they're generally, you know, if you talk about college and big sports, they're, they're generally men's football and basketball, and then all the other sports sort of get, you know, they're the second and third. But I, um, I would second. bring up Donna Lopiano's yeah. point about that, because uh, at the University of Southern California, how much money do we put into promoting uh, USC football? Right. And how much money do we put into promoting lacrosse? Right. Or women's, the, the water polo, right, which have dominated, and yeah. the coach is yeah. now fired water because polo. accepting yeah. bribes. But, <laughs> yeah, like 16 yeah. national yeah. championships, yeah. right. And it's just, yeah, avenue it's is just the idea that doesn't re it doesn't generate the, the, the kind of revenue and doesn't get the, the kind of attention that deserve, it deserves it. Part itself. of the reason it generates the revenue is we sell it harder. Yeah, you that's know, part we, of it, yeah. We promote it like crazy, and we put it on this platform and say, you all are Trojans and have the Trojan tradition because of the Trojan football team. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, the, the, there is a performative element to that that the Trojan football team, not recently, but has periodically been good, uh, and has periodically won national championships when we don't bring scandal to the university. Um, but at the same time, uh, we also, our entire narrative is built around that one team. Yeah. And we put literally tens of millions of dollars yeah. simply into promoting the football team. Yeah. We don't put that into promoting lacrosse. Yeah. We don't put that into promoting water polo. 
we don't put that into promoting any of the other uh, sports at USC. And we do it because we see it as a revenue generator in the end, but it's a revenue generator because you put revenue into it in the first place. Uh, and I, I, I do think the model has to change. People have to put revenue. Uh, they, they have to invest in promotion, not just invest in putting up a field. Invest in promotion of a right. broad array of sports. When you do that, uh, you're going to build audience. Yeah. For and they have to have faith that will that'll bring in dividends, not just financial, but you know, social as well. Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Um, so my question is sort of over the course of history, we've seen a lot of athletes pushed off of their platforms and even out of their fields in the case of like Colin Kaepernick, who we've been talking about for pretty much the whole panel. Um, and I was wondering if folks on the panel, this is really open to everyone, um, think that that's an exploitative behavior for us to just focus on the athlete and their skill set and what they bring to the table and their physical labor, but just to sort of like expect for them not to speak on political or social issues that impact them or their beliefs. So that's my question. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you want to. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, and, it, but it's, and, and look, part of this is, uh, is, a, um, is a management labor issue. Management tends to exploit labor. So that's, that's inevitable in this situation. Uh, but also, yes, the, the, it is purely exploitative uh, to think that because you've offered somebody a paycheck, they need to not talk about A, B, and C. That's, that's, that is, uh, and I, I would I, I hate to repeat myself, but I bring up uh, Kurt Flood again in that situation, the, the statement that we're well-paid slaves. That is, you're paying somebody to be, uh, to be owned by you. And the, the, the language, and this has been brought up by a number of folks, the language, especially in professional sports, where we still talk about owners and players as if players are owned by the owners. Uh, they, they are technically not, but the language itself lends to this exploitative type of behavior and type of communication where if you talk in a way that's contrary to what your owner wants you to say, uh, then, then your owner should have every right to just uh, cancel every contract on you. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it is problematic and exploitative from beginning to end in so many respects, I think. I, I think, you know, an interesting point about that too is um, in almost any other business, you know, you have employees and you have leadership uh, or ownership or whatever you want to call it, management. And, you know, there's this argument that's been made quite a bit like, well, you know, I work at this job, and if I were to be outspoken or protest, I would probably be fired, you know? And that may be true, but in most of those jobs, like, what is the product that you're developing at that company? You know what I mean? Because in sports, the product is the employee. <laughs> it is mm -hmm. the player. You know what I mean? So if, you're, if you've got this product that, yeah, I mean, yes, you, they are part of your team, and, and technically, you know, you own their contract or whatever. Um, you manage them. But you're putting your employees on the cover of magazines. You're selling your employees' jerseys, you know, not just the brand. You're, you're putting them on baseball cards and all this stuff. Like, uh, that's another level of, like, you know, of, 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 I guess a form of exploitation. Um, but then you expect them to just uh, not be have any opinion about anything, you know, unless it's just your opinion. Like, that's insane. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense to me. Because that's just, like, that's, it, it's an argument that makes no sense. Because almost every other profession or job, like, yeah. you know, you're an employee, but you are, the, I mean, there's, there's certainly exceptions to that, but you're an employee, but you are not the product. You know what I mean? And in that, in that case, in sports, like, you are absolutely the product. Uh, I, w I would disagree with that one comment, though. Uh, the athlete is not the product. The performance is the product. The athlete is the purveyor, the purveyor of that performance. Uh, and talking about the athlete as the product, I, I think really reinforces that notion of the athlete as being owned by, uh, by ownership. And when you do that, you, you play into the same kind of language. The athlete is selling performance to ownership. The athlete is not selling uh, political opinion to ownership. Ownership may think that that's what the athlete has to sell, but the athlete is selling performance to uh, the, the ownership of sport. 
Uh, and so the athlete, uh, you know, as it, it, you mentioned, with any other job, you sell the production of this product. When you walk away from that, you should have the, the you know, the, the right to uh, say or do anything that's not illegal uh, and, and not be uh, judged or fired for it. Uh, you, you have the right, in other words, you have the right to disagree with your, if you're working for 3M, you have the right to disagree with them about their product and what their product is and how good their sticky tape works or how well their sticky tape works. You have that right uh, because you are producing that product. As an athlete, you're producing performance. You have every right to talk about your performance, the company's performance, uh, the minute you step away. And it's that blurring of the line between what is owned and what is sold I think that, that puts athletes in a, in a difficult and in an exploitative position, or a position of being exploited. And, and there's a tremendous amount of, obviously, value, uh, Dr. Durbin, as you mentioned, that comes with that performance, which is why these athletes are so highly valued. And I think we're seeing several instances uh, recently where you've had a lot of athletes, particularly at the college level, feeling the sense of, of empowerment that if they're going to be treated like a commodity, they're certainly a highly valued commodity based on their performance. If we've seen that with you know, University of Missouri football team that they were, they decided that you know there was uh, an issue with uh, how how race discrimination was being handled at the university, and several of the players said, well, we're just gonna we're gonna boycott, and if we boycotted again the next SEC game, that was gonna represent uh, you know one or two million dollar loss, and once the players got involved and said we're gonna but yeah a lot more I'm gonna be underselling it here. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden the, the president decided, okay, well, we wanted, they wanted the president to resign and the president resigned because it, obviously that's, we're talking about sort of that kind of money, that kind of leverage that players, I think, d didn't understand or didn't realize that they actually have. And we're seeing, I think we're seeing more instances of that and, and, you know, Northwestern University football team wanted to unionize as well and understanding the value of their, their performance, their labor. And uh, so, you know, I think, w you know, we're certainly seeing more uh, perhaps uh, this is a, a, just a kind of a, a budding or uh, early uh, a growth in, in you know, players really becoming more empowered, and particularly in the college level, and, and you know, we'll see what that, that turns out to be. But um, I think they, they come, it first has to come with that realization that they, they, they wield a tremendous amount of uh, leverage and, and power, uh, particularly with the, a lot of these, these uh, big uh, sports uh, revenue generating uh, institutions, right, just by the, their, their talent and labor, what that represents. And you can't have a game without, without the players, right, without the performance, so thanks. Yeah, tickets are more, much more expensive this year for the Los Angeles Lakers than last year. And they're losing even more games this year than they were you last pay year. for LeBron. Why are those yeah. tickets more expensive? Yeah. 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 Uh, do we have another question or? So that just goes to show you make money whether you win or lose. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all, well, if you have LeBron in the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the, yeah. That's the. Any other uh, questions before we, we wrap things up? How much? I think we, uh, we have. Uh, it's like four minutes, so we, if anybody wants to ask, but otherwise I think we'll we'll uh, we'll wrap things up. So, well, thanks so much for coming, and uh, have a round of applause for our, our panelists here. Thank you, thanks so much. Thank you.